So here's some backstory for this channel. In uh, 2020, I made a New Year's resolution. I decided I would read more. I would get books, like fictional books, back into my life. I would make it a hobby like it used to be, and it had sort of died out without me, you know, even really paying attention to it. So I decided I was going to make a uh, concerted effort to become a reader again and part of that was eventually starting a channel so it has been uh, roughly a year a bit more than a year since i started doing these videos and it's been a year and a half roughly since i started uh like reading again like like you know properly reading books so i thought i would do some sort of video like retrospective of everything I've read so far but I wasn't sure exactly how to do it and I settled on this format of characters like my favorite characters not necessarily my favorite books some of my absolute favorite books are not on this list but just the characters that have really stuck with me since I started reading uh, again since I, I kind of became a reader again. It's really hot so I mean I've got the air conditioning on it's on uh, silent mode and I've got a fan on and it's on the lowest setting but still you might kind of hear a whirring sound coming in and out of this video or maybe just like low-key it's going on in the background all the time. Also if my face like starts melting at some point in this then just don't worry about it it's fine it's just like a melty kind of day. So we're gonna start off with a home invasion taken from a story from this book a bit shiny there but yeah it's called The Rest is Jungle it's a collection of short stories by Mario Benedetti translated by Harry Morales the story is called The Collection and the character that has stayed with me is a teenage girl called Miriam this story begins uh, with adults pointing guns at small children and through the conversation between the two groups we uh, we learn that the adults are home invaders and the children um, their parents are away somewhere it's told almost entirely in dialogue the whole story so like the pages look something like this you see there's hardly any like narrative tags all the way through which i thought was really interesting now the invaders soon discover that there's another person in the house which is a sibling uh, of the children a uh, 17 year old miriam who's in a wheelchair and uh, so quickly since she's the oldest one the leader of the group starts speaking to her to try and get information on the thing that they're looking for and then the rest of the short story is basically the dialogue between Miriam and this leader whose name is Slim. Now the first time I read this I was really interested in the form like the dialogue and I don't know just a book which is just people talking has a real appeal to me. Mario Benedetti has quite a few stories which are like this just voices like flowing back and forth in a conversational way like dialogue is just like really fascinating when it's removed from all the other bits of writing and like carries the narrative just by itself I think um, but I didn't I didn't get it like when I finished it I kind of felt like oh okay I guess that was that was kind of kind of interesting but the thing is that this story really stuck with me and I couldn't say why I just kept on going back to it in my head um, and eventually I decided you know what? I'll just read it again I'll just read it again because it's so short um, and it's so snappy because it's all dialogue and it's all like very natural dialogue um, so I read it a second time and the second time everything changed one thing I loved about it was the the transformation at the beginning the way that the tables turn so quickly because we obviously have a, a situation where there's one group which has power the home invaders and then there's the group which is powerless the children whose home has just been invaded um, and then when Miriam is introduced quickly that dynamic starts to change because Slim um, is really friendly and or at least you know he's putting on a friendly tone and he's asking the kids about their interests and he's showing interest in Miriam asking her what her life is like with her disability how she gets on with her parents because we know he's trying to get something out of her he wants the information that she has so that they can get the thing that they're looking for in the house um, whereas Miriam seems to know something but she refuses straight out she's like I'm not telling you anything so then it's really interesting right because you have a disabled teenage girl who holds power over uh, you know a fully grown man with a gun and like the the way that they interact with each other is really fascinating and then there's a second transformation and this is something I completely missed the first time I read it and I think the ending kind of reveals to you that there was a transformation and asks you to go back and read it in a way because I think Slim wasn't aware of it either but as they speak Miriam is slowly changing basically. Um, that's how it feels to me anyways. I feel like there's different ways to interpret it, but I feel that Miriam changes over the course of the conversation that she has with Slim. Like, whatever she thinks or believes at the beginning begins to shift 
um, as the story goes on. And that's what I found really fascinating. I think one of the reasons that like it went over my head is because the dialogue is so natural. It feels so normal, so conversational, so like, like unliterary. Do you know what I mean? That's how Mario Benedetti writes a lot of dialogue. It just sounds very like, so like mundane as to seem almost boring, but it's the fact that he can do it and also get across so much character and so much realism. And, and you know, the two characters, Miriam and Slim, have these goals that we're not quite exactly sure what they are, but we want to find out. So that every bit of their conversation seems like, holds the promise of telling us something new. So anyway, yeah, I thought Miriam especially was a really interesting, fascinating character. Next up we have Chiron. Chiron I think it's pronounced Chiron. This is the centaur, lovable centaur dad figure from The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. He's like this LGBTQ friendly, strong, stern, heart of gold, caring, non-toxic masculinity, uh, a paternal figure, which is just, I mean, I feel like we all need one of those in our lives, don't we? I was really fascinated when he appeared in the book because like in the actual myths, Chiron is super boring as a character. Like he's a, you know, basically he's a mytheme, which is just like a trope for myths. So like for the big heroes in, in Greek mythology, like Heracles and Theseus and whatever, um, they part of their becoming a hero thing is that they go off into the woods at some point in their youth, they meet Chiron the centaur, he teaches them a whole lot of things, and then they leave the woods and now they are just like, you know, one level higher to becoming a hero. It's just something you do. If you want to be a Greek hero, you go see Chiron, and then that ha that's it. There's no stories, really, about Chiron. He's just like a plot device, like I said. He's a mythian. He's not a character. So how the fact that she even included him in her story about Achilles and Patroclus was really interesting for me. I was like, what's she going to do with him? Is he just going to appear? Because he's a centaur. No, it's like, it's also quite you know, quite magical, like how is she gonna, how is she gonna deal with that whole thing? And in the end, the Chiron section is huge in the novel. It's like, I don't know, like almost a fourth of the book or something, and it's brilliant. It's basically like the, the place where Achilles and Patroclus can have space to themselves to develop and to eventually fall in love. And the fact that they can do that with the sort of safety and care uh, that is provided by somebody else who's, you know, just like a, basically a family figure for them is, is so refreshing and, and just wholesome and lovely and, and he was definitely one of the best things about the Song of Achilles for me um, and, and definitely the best character. Next up is Moomin Mama, specifically from uh, The Moomins and the Great Flood, or and the Flood, by Tove Janssen. Now, this is the very first uh, incarnation of the Moomins that was ever written. And I was familiar with the comics, and I really loved the comics um, with, that Tove Janssen had written about Moomins. And in those ones, Moomin Mama had never really stood out as an interesting character to me. She's just like the stereotypical mother side character, and I had no real interest uh, in her. She's, I mean, all the characters were great I love the movements but like she didn't like kind of make a strong impression on me um, however, in those comics, the Moomins are settled down in a house uh, in a place called the Moomin Valley. Whereas in this first story, it's before they have a house, it begins with just Moomin Mama and her son, Moomin Troll, uh, having been abandoned you know, years previously by Moomin Papa, who went off searching for adventures in the world. And it's just the two of them in the wilderness looking to find a new home. And that obviously completely changes the dynamics surrounding uh, Moomin Mama as a character, right? Um, she's not a mother maintaining a home, she is a mother trying to find a home and build a home and create like a, a place of safety for her for her family. So as well as the sort of stereotypical motherhood tropes of being caring and wise and, and practical and conservative with a small c and, and cautious, there's all that there. But as well as that, there's this stuff that I'd never noticed in the character before, which is this incredible resilience and drive to just keep on going and get things done. And, and also like this kind of radical empathy uh, and willingness to accept other people, strangers, into her own group. And, and to take care of them. And all of this is going on in like a very like normal fairy tale kind of story, but it's just, it was so moving for me. I think personally it hit me really hard because like it made me feel like I had sort of taken the Moomin Mama from the comics for granted. 
um, and like everything that she'd done to achieve that stability. And it made me it kind of like unlocked my own feelings about my own mother, who I felt I'd taken for granted until like around my 20s, when I started to like really think about and, and understand the struggles she'd gone through and also traveling across the world like Moom and Mama to, uh, you know, build a place for her family. I guess because I was like really interested, like a lot of teenagers are, in the importance of uh, destabilizing things that I didn't really think about like how important it was to create stability so that people can grow up um, not feeling that their lives are precarious or that you know they don't know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. I'm getting all emotional just thinking about it so we're going to move on to the next character although the next one is also a very strong uh, mother stereotype. Takamatsu Emiko from the Drifting Classroom uh, manga series written by Umezu Kazuo. This story is about uh, some student, a whole school, there's an explosion. There's an explosion and a school gets transported into the future and the future is an apocalyptic wasteland and the main story is about how uh, these kids, especially one kid called Takamatsu Sho, and how they survive basically in a world with no resources and, and, and weird monsters and, 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 and a few adults who've gone completely insane. Sort of Lord of the Flies kind of thing but sci-fi. Um, but there's this subplot right because meanwhile back in our own time the school and the children inside of it have disappeared and there was a huge explosion and there's just like a crater in the earth so everyone presumes that whatever happened everyone is, is dead right everyone's just been incinerated even though there's no there's no trace there's no remains but as time goes on it becomes clear that like whatever happened all the children are gone they're probably not coming back um, now Takamatsu Emiko, who, who fought with her son just before he went to school that morning, feels huge amounts of guilt and, and denial, and she can't believe that her son is gone. Um, and we know, of course, that he isn't really gone, well, he's just in the future. And the interesting thing is that her denial and her grief are actually, um, you know, kind of accurate. So while the other mothers are starting to accept that their children are dead and they set up like an immor a memorial by the school with all the names of the dead on it she um is is continuously saying no no he i'm sure he's alive somehow and then you know to top it off uh there's a psychic link which somehow gets created between them unexplained so far although i've not finished the, the, the series yet so i don't know maybe it'll get explained maybe not <laughs> but the point is that she actually hears his voice from the future telling her mom I'm alive I'm safe I'm well I need you to help me out because I'm in the future and if you do things in the past it can affect things in the in the future so it's sort of like a Bill and Ted scenario you know what I mean like yeah usually that kind of time travel stuff is really annoying I think and I, I have no interest in it but in this case it's so interesting because of how it affects the, the mother's character you know like She's hearing voices. She's hearing voices of her, her supposedly dead son telling her to do things. So, and she seems like she's, you know, any rational person would think that she has gone insane with grief or that she has become delusional with grief. And her character is just so fun to read. Like, she, one day she goes shopping for groceries and on her way back she sees the memorial. Um, in the in the in the place where the explosion was, and she sees all the mothers like laying flowers down for their dead children, and she just like goes up to them and she says, "Why did you put my son's name there? Get his name off of that thing!" And she starts like trying to scratch it out, and then they go up to her and they you know they're kind of being sympathetic and they're saying, "Look, Emiko, like." Or Miss Takamatsu, I guess, that, you know, you should just try and accept it like we've done. It's really hard, but our children are gone. They're not coming back. And honestly, like, you need to move on. And, <laughs> like, it's, it's so funny because, you know, that's the nice thing to say to somebody in this situation, right? Um, even though we know as the reader that, that, that actually she's right. And she just, like, loses it. She just says, how dare you give up on your children and then have the audacity to ask me to give up on my own son? And then she just, like, decks the mother. She punches her in the face and she says this is what I think of your your stupid memorial and she takes out the eggs from her groceries and she just starts egging the the memorial of all these dead children in front of the grieving mothers and it's like it's really hysterical but in a way which is just so funny and darkly like brilliant I think it's also kind of satirical I think like there's a, you know society has this idea about mother's love as being this sort of beautiful pure ideal thing um, and so if you take that mother's love to its you know, logical but ridiculous extremes, then it's just really uh, like an engaging way, I think, to deal with, with other things like grief and madness. And it's funny. It's just really funny. Now, I have decided to allow myself only one character per book because when it comes to this one, when it comes to demons, 
all of the characters, almost all of the characters, were just so amazing and so fascinating that they would almost every single character in this book, which is full of loads of characters, would be on this list. They are some of the best characters that I've ever read. Dostoevsky is just brilliant at writing characters. So, you know, characters was a big thing in this book, basically. Um, but if I had to pick one, if I had to pick just one, and it's not like it's not like it's, it's super easy to pick one because they're also great. But if I had to pick one, it would be um, Varvara Petrovna. Varvara Petrovna is uh, introduced very early in the novel. She's a landowner. She is uh, worried about her position in society, um, kind of the high society of St. Petersburg, but also the very local society of the unnamed town where the book actually takes place. Um, so she's a person of sort of high status, but a lot of things have made that, made that status start to diminish over the years. She's aging, she's a widow, the people from St. Petersburg, her connections are starting to forget her. They don't really come down to this little town that's kind of rural. She's got this son who she loves dearly, but he's left and these strange stories keep coming back to her about how disreputable some of the things he's doing are and that's all very worrying. Also early in the novel, the serfs are emancipated. Uh, like this historical thing where the serfs who are basically like slaves all get emancipated so all the people on her land are now free so that means that she obviously loses a lot of power and status and to top it all off she's attached herself to this this scholar um, as a sort of social companion hoping to increase her intellectual uh, and social like status in the world and as well as being progressive it turns out that he's just I don't know, he's just kind of useless and he's a gambler and he's really paranoid and he always thinks the government is, is out to get him and he just breaks down and cries a lot of the time so it's just, it's not great for her. Her relationship with this man, um, Stepan Trofimovich, is something which I think is kind of like key to the whole book. It's not, it's not like the main story, it's not like about their relationship, but the relationship is established at the beginning and it kind of is an undercurrent all the way through. To give you a flavor of what she's like, um, one of my favorite, my favorite line that she says is when she comes back from Switzerland after a long trip and she's speaking to the scholar Stepan Trofimovich. She says, and do you take your exercise? Do you go for a four mile walk every day as the doctor prescribed? Not not always. Just as I thought. I felt it even in Switzerland. I just love the idea that while she was like by Lake Geneva or whatever, she could feel somehow, she could just feel that this stupid scholar wasn't going for his walks like the doctor told him to. I think that kind of like maternalistic thing is also like why she, she is the one that I would pick out of all the people in this book because I love uh, Dostoevsky as a writer, but until Demons, I had never really uh, thought that he was good at writing women. Like, I thought that there was just, you know, something that he was really bad at, you know, to be honest. Like, in all the books that I'd read by him, and I, have, I haven't read some of his most important books yet, like Brothers Karamazov or The Idiot, but I've read a lot of other ones. And in all of those, whenever women appear, like, they're like the, what's it called, like the innocent prostitute. Right? I've seen that a few times. So she's like, she's a fallen woman, but she's actually got a heart of gold. And the main character interacts with this fallen woman and kind of, you know, the, the woman is like an object for the, for the, for, for the male protagonist to develop and to, to create like his own, his own sort of subjective, subjective thoughts and so on. So yeah, really boring stuff in terms of female characterization. But in this book, as well as Varvara Petrovna, there are a few other women and they all have different types of femininity and Dostoevsky shows that he not only can write women characters but also that he can explore femininity and you know it's definitely not like a super feminist book I don't want to oversell it in that like regard but for me just finding out that one of my favorite writers is able to do something which I find like a really I guess important and engaging part of, of, of reading in general uh, was just wonderful and Varvara Petrovna is the first character where I where I learned that he could do that. Next up is Izumi Shikibu from the Diary of Izumi Shikibu, written by Izumi Shikibu. It's in this book of Japanese poetic diaries. So this was like a form that was popular at the time. It's kind of like an epistolary novel with poetry. So it, there are diary entries and in the diary entries and in between the diary entries there are poems. So it's a really lovely mixture between poetry and prose and often the prose kind of builds up to a certain like climax which is like released into a poem or the the prose kind of like sandwiches poems in really interesting ways so the form is super interesting it's like absolutely one of my favorite forms for writing fiction in um although like 
how much of this is real and how much is fictionalized is kind of up for debate, I think. Um, but yeah, this, the, the character of Izumi Shikibu, as she writes herself, uh, presumably, like it, there's a bit of like it's a bit uncertain whether or not she actually wrote it or not. And one of the reasons why is because she's kind of quite dislikable and unpleasant as a character. But I think most people agree that she did write it, which makes it all the more interesting that she writes herself in this kind of unflattering way. The diary chronicles this on-off relationship that she has with her ex-lover's brother, um, who is like a prince or something. And it's like really interesting because both of both her and her lover are really like angsty, emo, kind of like, you know, self-indulgently unhappy people who are they're very much in love with each other, but they're also, you know, very uncommunicative and suspicious of each other and worried about how the relationship is going to harm their social standing and um, constantly kind of like giving up on the other one and mistrusting. And it's really like kind of unhappy love. And that's it. It's just like kind of sad love vibes for the whole thing. There is basically no plot. You know, an event will happen like he'll come to see her. He'll spend the night. There'll be some sort of like... Uh, slightly sexy elusive poetry about nature and animals which could mean some other things um, and then you know he'll go away and they'll feel sad and then maybe he'll come back again maybe he won't and it's just yeah it just goes on and on and on to be honest like I actually gave up on this the first time I started reading it because I thought where is it going why am I in this in this world like it started off so great and now we're just in this quagmire of love angst and poems and I didn't know I just I, I wasn't in the right place for it and also like the second time I got to it, I read it kind of in one go, and it was so much better that way. Like, if you're just there for the vibes, then they are really great vibes, you know? Don't worry about the plot. The plot does not matter in this. It's about the vibes and the character and the interactions, and, and Izumi Shikibu, like, she is the main thing. Because as well as being miserable, she's so proud. She's so proud of who she is because she's like a, an aristocrat, right? And she's she's proud almost of her own miserable love as well, which is really fun to read. She's also talented. She's just such a talented poet. Like she's obviously the more talented of the two, uh, well, uh, her and her lover, when they're sending the poems back and forth. Because his poems always tend to be like, you know, he's trying to get something out of it. He's trying to say, make her confess that she loves him or something or get her to say that he can come and see her more often or something like that. He's always, you know, he's got like kind of some communicative aim uh, in his poems, whereas her poems are like kind of responding to his and using the images of, you know, birds and nature and trees and stuff like that, and then recycling them and then like kind of shifting the meaning to mean something totally different. Or, you know, when he says, oh, I'm so sad because I can't see you in his poems, she says, you know, if you're sad and, and she uses his metaphors in this way, then I'm sad in this way. And she like flips the metaphor on the head. And the fact that the poems are sort of like a game between the two of them, you know, it's like there's a challenge. And she's always able to counter his poems in such a sort of like flirtatious and yet depressed way. So yeah, it's just a great time. Now back to ancient Greece for Iphigenia from Iphigenia and Aulis, which is a Greek play by uh, Euripides, uh, and I've read it in this book. It's uh, one of my favorite Greek plays, uh, Greek tragedies, I should say. The story of Iphigenia is actually also told in the Song of Achilles, so people who've read that will be familiar with it maybe. Um, in that one, basically, well, what happens is the, when the, the Greeks are going to go to Troy and uh, someone, like, forgets to do a sacrifice for Artemis or something like that, she won't let the boats sail because there's a big storm. Now, the goddess makes a storm. The boats can't sail. Everyone is kind of freaking out because there's this huge army, the biggest army the world has ever seen. Um, and basically, some guy says the only way for the, the, stor the storms to clear and dissipate is if the general of the army sacrifices his daughter, like human sacrifice. So this is something that actually ancient Greek people thought was barbaric. Um, but they do it. They do it in this story anyways. And the way that the general, Agamemnon, uh, manages to do it is that he fakes a marriage with Achilles. So he basically tells his, his wife, oh yeah, I've decided to marry uh, our daughter Iphigenia to Achilles, so please bring her to the battlefield. That way no one is suspicious. She arrives there in her wedding dress. Everyone's ready for a wedding. Achilles is also told, yeah, you're going to marry her. Um, and then the moment she gets there, she gets brutally killed by her own father and sacrificed. And then the storm clears and everyone goes on their own way. So in the Song of Achilles, this episode is really condensed and it kind of like left 
a bad taste in my mouth. First of all, because I loved Iphigenia so much from the actual uh, play, um, and, you know, she only appears just to get murdered. But also because, you know, and, you know, props to Madeleine Miller, because this actually is probably the original function of the myth in part, but the, if Iphigenia basically exists just to create tension between her father, Agamemnon the general, and Achilles, who is like the best soldier. Uh, on the on the Greek side, so that is that the drama, you know, the conflict between Agamemnon and Achilles is one of the main driving things from the Iliad. So I'm sure, like at some point, somebody thought, oh, how can we like kind of intensify this drama? Let's have it so that she was supposed to marry this guy, and then the dad actually killed her, and that you know, and it's a good story. It is really good. Don't get me wrong, but it's that traditional love triangle kind of scenario. Although obviously it's not really a love triangle here, but you know what I mean. It's like where the woman is the object for the two men to have a sort of relationship over and that kind of feeds into their feelings of rivalry and hatred against each other. So the woman just exists to die so that the men can have an interesting conflict is what I mean, right? Um, and that's what it is in the Song of Achilles. And you know, since the Song of Achilles is sort of a modern uh, book, it kind of, yeah, leaves a bad taste in your mouth. It's like kind of, you, you, you think that we have moved on past these depictions of women to an extent in society. So I get why Madeleine Miller did that because, you know, her story is about Achilles. But still, yeah, the original, well, the, I mean, it's not an original, but the old, oldest telling of the Iphigenia myth, I think, that we have is so much better because Iphigenia, even though she also doesn't, like, you know, appear in it for a lot of it, even though it's her name is in the title, right, but she only comes on, like, on screen, on stage, for a few times uh, in the whole thing. And she's a child, right? So she's she's written like a child. She's not got like these amazing speeches or anything like that. Um, or rather, she does have amazing speeches. But it's the, the reason they're amazing is not because of why speeches are normally amazing. It's because her character is just so... I don't know how to say it. I think children in literature are really hard to make interesting, if that makes sense. In literature, we tend to deal with like really adult themes, I think, and like themes which are sort of like very sophisticated, and it's hard for a child to realistically uh, like engage with those kind of very sophisticated ideas. So we can have like fun children and interesting children and like exciting children, but really like engaging children in literature, I think is just something that I rarely see. And Iphigenia is a rare case for me because the, the thing that makes her great is that first of all, yeah, she is really convincing as a child. She learns it's different from the Achilles story in this one because she actually learns that she's going to be sacrificed before she is sacrificed. So there's that tension. She obviously does not want to be sacrificed. She does not want to die. Neither um, does her mother want her to die. So her, her reactions are kind of realistic. Um, but the way that this story goes, the way that she slowly starts to change and the reasons that she changes her way of thinking um, are just absolutely fascinating and they're to do with societies they're to do with how stupid like governing bodies are when they're run by like big angry sweaty men who just feel that they they need to get their goals through it's really hard for me to explain what is just so good about Iphigenia except that she's like one of the most convincing children that I've read one of the most engaging children that I've read um and the way that her even when her like, she's flawed, like any other, like, main character in the Euripides play. She's flawed and she makes terrible mistakes. But the way that her mistakes reflect on society and, and the, you know, the world around her, especially the men around her, reflect on the terrible things that they have been sort of putting on her and the way that she has managed to deal with those things, confront them, uh, unfortunately absorb some of them, like the bad ones, but also, like, overcome them and, like, kind of become a, a weird kind of hero to, you know, through her very innocence is like just absolutely incredible and she is definitely one of the best characters that I have read since I started reading again. So that's it basically. I want to give honorable mentions uh, without saying like loads, just honorable mentions to Eleanor from The Haunting of Hill House who is incredible, um, uh, Ito Noe and Hiratsuka Raicho from Beauty and Disarray, both uh, fictionalized versions of real historical feminist women in Japan whose stories are also just absolutely amazing um, and I had such a good time like with those characters um, and also Makabea from The Hour of the Star which I have here 
Yeah, really, ow, really freaky cover. I'm not exactly sure what she's got in those tweezers, if it's like a grain of rice or something. But anyway, yeah, like um, Maccabee, I didn't like this book, uh, but the story of Maccabee was so interesting. I said in another video somewhere, I hated the, the narrator in the book who is, you know, like writing the story of Maccabee and he keeps on interrupting and saying like, oh, isn't it interesting how her character is like this? And what shall I make her do now as the writer who is writing this woman? And it's horrible. Uh, it was actually written by a woman, by the way. Um, and so I'm sure it's deliberate, but it's still horrible. But Maccabea herself is super fascinating. I've never read a character like her before. Um, if only I could somehow get rid of the narrator in the book, which is probably the point of the book, but whatever. Um, I would love to hear, uh, I would love to read about Maccabea in a different in a different way, if that makes sense. So I didn't like the book, but love the character. Anyway, that's it. That's all of the characters that I'm gonna talk about for now. I was surprised looking back on this list that there was only one man and you know, he's, he's not even a full man, he's half horse. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But anyway, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say for now. Let me know if you've read some fascinating characters lately uh, or if you have read any of the ones on this list and you really agree or massively disagree with any of my takes on them. Would love to chat about it with you in the comments that was a weird sentence weird pacing weird phrasing sounds like it's time to finish the video if you liked it please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already done so hope you're all keeping well all the light is gone all the light is gone from the day so it might be a little bit grainy but what are you gonna do what are you gonna do i will see you in the next video bye bye